Welcome to the 13th episode of the Doc Talk with Liz podcast. Our guest star today is Dr. Afshin Beheshti. Dr. Beheshti is a researcher at KBR, NASA's Ames Research Center, where he does research with developing the Gene Lab project. In this episode, Dr. Beheshti walks us through some of his projects and his journey to NASA. He also discusses work-life balance and gives tips for those who want to work for NASA someday. Um, Hi, Dr. Beheshti. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, So I kind of just want to, I know that you uh, do some work for NASA now and also like leading an international COVID research team, but I was hoping to kind of start off by just talking about what led you to science in the first place. Were your parents in science or engineering or anything like that? Or was this kind of that something that developed, um, you kind of developed on your own? Yeah, sure. Um, no, so my, yeah, no, my parents weren't scientists or engineers. Uh, my dad is a commercial pilot. He's retired oh. now, but <laughs> so no, no science there. Um, so, uh, you know, basically, yeah, growing up, I was, got interested in science. Science always was curiosity for me. So, you know, that's where I ended up because, uh, uh I, I, you know, asking the question why is key, right? right. <laughs> why do things occur? <laughs> why do things happen? And, and, you know, and, you know, and I had a pretty good analytical, like math base, you know, for my, background too so you know I was interested in physics originally so then that's how things evolved yeah. okay is that what you majored in in undergrad was physics yeah so yeah I went to and I grew up in Minnesota so I went to University of Minnesota there and I got a physics degree so originally when I was an undergrad I was doing a lot of high energy physics so okay. completely different from biology <laughs> right <physics. laughs> but high energy yeah so high energy physics you know for people who are not familiar with it right it's basically looking at high energy particles and looking at trying to find out what one of the, you know, what, what, what could be the, the ultimate goal is like, you know, what, what is, what unifies all the forces in nature together. Right. You know, so, you know, so, and then some people like, you know, or uh, another goal is to look at, you know, why, what, why does mass exist? So, you know, they look at high energy particles, you know, they go through those big uh, colliders, super colliders, you know, you'd heard about in CERN in Switzerland or Fermilab in Chicago. And then, you know, they would collide these particles at high energies together and find all these new interactions at really tiny, tiny, micro, more more than microscope, but atomic levels, you know, how the atoms are working together. Is that what you studied in your PhD as well? No, so my PhD, uh, I went to Florida State University and there uh, I took a switch to more like biophysics. So oh, okay. I was going to do high energy physics, but I realized, you know, that I was more interested in the biology aspect of it. But so... You know, that's in when you go to graduate school in physics, you take all your basic courses in the beginning. Right. Um, at least back when I was going to grad school. So, you know, you take the, your your Newtonian physics, your quantum physics, all that stuff. So then and then, you know, you would then figure out what you want to research in. So then, yeah. So when I was going to graduate school, I decided that, you know, more biology aspects. So I was working on basically um, how does as a physicist, you know, I was looking at how does DNA move through objects. I didn't care about the, about the A, G, C, T, you know, <laughs> right. in, in biology. I just care really physically how it moved through objects and then modeling that. So that was basically my PhD. Okay. And what do you, so I know that you are involved in a lot of different research projects now, but I know that um, when we were talking before, you were mentioning a lot of stuff about your cancer research with microRNAs. Uh, can you kind of describe that for people that might not be familiar with it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, to, to touch on working different projects, like I think it's a <laughs> physicist trait where physics physicists are basically considered jack of all trades, but master of none. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you the master of none part. That's our secret. We can, we gotta say no, you know, that part right. we don't say in, in public, but no, but yeah, basically, you know, as a physicist, you're mathematically inclined and you can actually do like a lot of different things and, I, I tend to do a lot of wet lab work too. Some physicists okay. tend to focus purely on the computational work. So I, right. I did computa- I do computational in math. But. So yeah. So when I was uh, when I transitioned to do a postdoc, like I joined a cancer lab. Um, we call the systems. You know, physicists were labeled systems biologists. Right. <laughs> right. So this was their label. And system biology for people who are not familiar is basically the idea that. Um, taking all interdisciplinary people, like from biology, cancer, mathematicians, chem- chemists. Whoever else, because, you know, people started realizing, you know, a decade or so ago that, um, you know, biologists can't do it by themselves and physicists can't do it. But, no, we need all the different minds and different backgrounds to work together to solve yeah. these you know, complex bio- biology problems. So that's, same, that's how it goes to cancer. So, yeah. So when I started with cancer, 
was working in various aspects, like looking at, you know, radiation biology and how radiotherapy might happen. And then um, also the PI, the principal Vesica I was working under, um, she had some NASA grants that were working on effects of space radiation on, you know, development of cancer, you know, for example, you know, that was one thing. And then eventually once I, you know, started working at Tufts Medical Center, uh, Tufts University, the faculty appointment there, uh, then I started uh, looking at microRNAs, as you mentioned. So microRNAs are, you know, really small micro uh, RNA, which is like around 22 bases nucleotides. And, uh, and basically, uh, you know, before 2000, people thought that was debris because people were like, oh, these small, small fra- uh, fragments of RNA debris, they tossed it away. They, they didn't pay attention to it. Right. So like the first person actually to pay attention was in 1993, but then the seven years passed and no one paid attention to it again. And there was a worm, C. elegans. And then someone's, people started going back to that and be like, oh, these things actually have a lot of uh, uh, function. Mm-hmm. So like then the exponentially grew in the past couple of decades where people started realizing, you know, these microRNAs are, can regulate th- hundreds and hundreds of genes, you know, in your body. They can stop proteins from, you know, uh, 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 because, you know, when the RNA can make proteins, right, translate into proteins. So it could block that process and it could, you know, Im- impact your DNA. It could do a lot of things. And then since they're so small, they're very stable. They can float in your body. Mm-hmm. Um, several different ways where they could have like a protein attached to it to let it get in and out of cells. So I'll call that freely floating or they're packed in some these vesicles or they're packed with lipids and they get in and out of cells. So, you know, they have different ways. And then, so, you know, there's good microRNAs and there's bad microRNAs. So as we know, so then there's h- thousands of microRNAs that people have discovered. And, you know, and my idea is that, you know, that since most diseases are impact, like insult of injury to your body, let's say like radiation, you know, and right. impact your body or, some, or something like that, or any disease like cancer, there should be a microRNA signature associated with that. All you have to do is figure it out, you know, have a figure out a way to do it. And I think I've done some, have a technique to do it pretty well. If the data is there, the data's not there, you can't do it. Right. <laughs> so the cancer stuff is still really kind of lymphoma. That's what I was trying to look at, you know, and I've determined the microRNA signature associated with that. And then, and if we had a mouse model to start with, as a lot of cancer research starts, like you're looking at, you know, cancer right. tumor models in mice. And then it evolved to, um, uh, you know, looking at human samples. You get, you know, st- from blood, you get donor samples from um, patients who, you know, would volunteer their, uh, bio, you know, samples for research. So they'll give blood to us. And then we found out, yeah, indeed, that the microRNA signature figure on lymphoma is floating around in, in the blood of cancer patients who are, mm-hmm. You know, diagnosed with um, this diffuse large piece of lymphoma while in non-cancer or healthy uh, people you know this wasn't there so you know that's the signature so now of course then you can evolve that more and more research to try to figure out if this is a good biomarker to use and then you know potentially block these guys these microRNAs if you block them because they're floating around causing things to happen potentially to increase cancer risk if you just block them, you know, with the antagonist sequence to them, because they're single stranded, right? So you block yeah. them, they can't get in and out of cells and just be inert. So your body would just flush it out as garbage, you know, but once it becomes inert. So that's yeah. the idea, you know, then, then the therapeutic part we're trying to figure out and work on for the cancer angle, at least. Right. That's really fascinating. And I'm wondering, um, with your background being in physics, how does that kind of relate to um, that kind of research? Because I think a lot of people think like cancer and microRNAs and they automatically think biology, but like you're coming at it kind of from a physics or a biophysics perspective. So how does that kind of like mix? Well, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't, <laughs> but no, it does too. So, you know, it's a short answer, but no, but see, so basically what a PhD teaches a person is to read and think for themselves, right? right? So, right. <laughs> and so that's the idea. And, and basically none of my PhD was really related to what I'm doing now, but the analytical skills I learned and the you know, thought process skills I learned as a PhD um, taught me to be, you know, to think about things in the way I do. So, you know, I've only, I only had a, a freshman biology course. That's it. <laughs> that's the only biology course I ever, oh I ever took. You know, so. <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, as you probably know, and your listeners know, like biology, you know, there, there are fundamental things in biology that never change. Right. But there are things that you learned 20 years ago in textbook that are completely different now and new and like it changed just because, you know, how biology has this ever changing. It's not like physics where, you know, you got Newtonian mechanics, that's set. <laughs> that doesn't change. <laughs> you know? 
so so that's the thing so yeah so my my skills i think was more important what i learned i mean i had i had learned some you know things in the lab that worked but i wasn't working on microRNAs. it's just thinking outside the box kind of thinking right and then so the biology part you know yeah it's like the microRNA world being 20 years you know since discovery that's still in the biology world it's in its infancy still the wild west right so a lot of things you do is novel until someone else proves that it isn't or <laughs> that proves it right or wrong you know <laughs> so it's a kind of a neat field to be in with you know these microRNAs to look at because you know everything you're doing a lot of things you're doing it, it, you know no, no one has done before so that's the key part but i mean the other part is too you know i think that's the key for people getting you know going to say physics the skills you learn like because we have a computational background and like analytical background mathematical background plus you know people who are in the wet lab can actually do the wet lab part too right so it's more it's more like just uh, the thinking skill and then you know having a the other key part is being open for open science and meaning collaborate collaborators so having a large network of you know, biologists, for example, so I could say, oh, you know, throughout the years, I would talk to them. And, and other than reading, you have to talking to people is a good way of learning, right? So the biologists say, you know, I would interact with them, say, what about this idea? They'd be like, no, see, you're too crazy. Think of something else. <laughs> or they'll say, oh, no, this is great. You know, I haven't thought about it that way. So let's let's see what we can work together to expand on this. And then you get other people from other fields in, so they get different views and fresh views to come in. So that's the key. You're, you know, I think the key to science is to having that large network of a lot of multidisciplinary people right. in it to talk to each other. Right. And I think like biophysics is a great field for that. Um, like you were saying, just because it's literally like the combination of two different or seemingly different fields. And so it kind of gives you an opportunity to like explore things with, from a different perspective. Yeah, exactly. um, but I was also going to ask, so you do um, a lot of different things, but like now space biology, <laughs> um, how does your work with microRNAs does that kind of connect to your work or research with space biology? Or is Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, as I said like, you know, for microRNAs I think does this have to be cancer the same idea. Any kind of thing there should be any when 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 there's a disease or an a, a chance to have increased health risks because let's say you're exposed to radiation. Right. Um the microRNA signature is to be some something associated with that. So, you know, in space or for people that know, when you were protected, in, you know, we talked about this, where you're protected on your earth, you're protected by the atmosphere. And then the low earth orbit, you have this magnetic field, the magnetosphere on the earth that right. um, reduces the, the radiation you might get in deep space. So when you're in deep space, there's all, constantly these heavy ions floating around and that, that causes like these um, high energy uh, uh, radiation to, to, would radiate astronauts or humans as they're going through because this is constantly these and these things were generated from like black holes or supernovas from far away so there's constantly like iron particles uh, helium particles you know protons and there's that background radiation that we don't experience on earth right and then people on low earth orbit where you know previously the shuttle, shuttle missions were done and then now the international space station's there right so they they they, they get exposed to that but the magnetic field reduces that dose yeah so it's not as 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 full blown effect you might get. Right. And there's another type of radiation called solar particle events, which, as it sounds like, it's like the sun. When you get a solar flare, you get this high dose of protons all of a sudden, high energy protons right. that would expose the astronauts to you know uh, high energy, which is concerning. It doesn't happen all the time, and you could probably plan for that because you might notice, oh, there's about a solar flare to happen, and then right. it takes X amount of time, not that much time, to come to Earth, but. So, you know, those are the things. And then, of course, you got microgravity, which, you know, the lack of gravity there. So, you know, you, you would, as people probably know, you know, they could cause like muscle degeneration, other health risks that happen. So those are one of the two main, there's other like issues too in space, but those are the two main things I think for me when I research are, are, are causing a lot of the health risks that, you know, might be associated with all that damage. So as I said, like not now when you got your whole body being impacted by like this basically exposed to that radiation or microgravity, you're going to have a microRNA signature probably associated to um, that, that increase in health risks associated with those damage caused to your body. So then that's where, you know, I, I did the same techniques as I used previously in cancer. And then I figured out, oh, there is this microRNA signature there. And then there's some papers we put out last year and more to come that, you know, indeed identify like a biomarker potentially of a group of microRNAs associated with space radiation microgravity effects. And then we've tested the, the, so, you know, developing a biomarker we're doing, and then we're also testing as a countermeasure because in space, you know, we call it countermeasures because as opposed to therapeutics, because you want to prevent it before the damage right. is caused. So that's why it's a countermeasure, right? 
so therapeutic is after you had the disease, you got to, you know, of course, you can't, you know, uh, the, battle that disease or cancer, for example, and then do it. But in space, that's why it's called a countermeasure. We want to take that precaution before even you have a chance of forming any kind of health risk. Yeah. So that's where we're doing some experiments now to block these microRNA signatures, and we're getting some interesting, uh, really promising results that some of it's in the papers we put out last year, where um, you know, we see the by blocking these, you can mitigate some of the damage caused by space radiation. Or in the mm-hmm. in the cell kind of culture, we've completely blocked, you know, uh, mitigated some of the responses. You know, so now we're doing mice mice experiments in biology experiments to figure that out. So, right, definitely, that's. Right. In the first part of this podcast interview, we learned that Dr. Braheshti developed a love for science as a kid. He was very curious and had strong math skills. He went to the University of Minnesota for undergrad and majored in physics. At this stage, he did high energy physics research. High energy physics research is the study of the particles that make up matter and the interactions between these particles. For his PhD, Dr. Braheshti went to Florida State and started studying biophysics. He primarily looked at how DNA moves through objects. For his postdoc, he studied cancer in a systems biology lab. Systems biology is an interdisciplinary field that combines multiple different disciplines. MicroRNA, which are small fragments of RNA that have gene regulatory capabilities, are useful as signatures for measuring the impact of space radiation on human health. really interesting and this research is this is the um the space biology research is with nasa right yeah so i have a few nasa grants and that's what you know that's what would cover those uh, uh you know usually as you probably know in the science field you know people would apply for grants and right. <laughs> after getting many rejections you finally get yeah. some hopefully if you if you stay with it <laughs> but that's part of the game of academics you know right. they say usually one in they used to say one in ten, one in ten grants you apply for would get funded. Now I think it's more one in twenty. But you know that's that's part of it. You just keep applying, keep applying, and then eventually, if your ideas are good enough, hopefully you'll get funded. So right. yeah, so this, these are a couple of grants I had um, from NASA and this other uh, uh, agency called the Trish, which is the Translational Research for Space Health. I should know. Yeah, translational. <laughs> yeah, translational <laughs> for space. <laughs> Trish. But they're, they're out of Baylor and they're basically, um, they get NASA funds for high risk, high reward programs, you know. So basically, what NASA won't fund is high risk, Trish would fund, and then they evolve into like these nice projects and they were able to give me money to work on the microRNAs. And that, and another NASA grant I have, I worked on, you know, microRNAs and the same idea. So there's a couple of ones then, yeah. So those are for NASA funded grants. Um, yeah, currently I'm at, working at KBR at NASA Ames uh, Research Center. So and there's other projects I worked on there, but those microRNA ones are, yeah, NASA funded grants. Awesome. Um, and I kind of wanted to, so KBR, is that, where is that located? Um, like So, yeah, so uh, most people don't know this, like, you know, in the government, there's, there's this nuance where you got civil servants, right? And this is all like, you know, NIH, NASA, DOD, okay. it's, all, it's all the same. So you got civil servants, and those are the ones that are actual employed by the government. So, you know, they basically there's jobs for life usually. And then that's 20% of the workforce in the government. The other 80%, that they're, they're, contra- they're, they're working for companies that are contracted by the government. I see. So, 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 you know, like, for example, KBR is one of them, where NASA Ames Research Center, you know, in, in the Bay Area, where, um, you know, there's one, one of the contracting companies that, are kind of by NASA to work is KBR, which is KBR is a big, big company that works in a lot of different fields. Like, um, you know, they have things with the Air Force, the Army, you know, and then they have things all over the world, like in Australia, Asia, you know, and they work on different things from related to military, to space biology, to health, you know, not health, not health as much, but they're getting into that, but like environmental things, you know, so that, but, you know, and one, one, one of the contracts they have with NASA is to work on different projects at NASA Ames, you know, or they also have one on NASA Johnson, uh, Johnson Space Center in NASA. So, you know, that's, that's one of them. There's other contracting companies throughout NASA too that like that, you know, so there's 80% of the workforce, which is, I'm one of them, you know, I, the employer is, you know, from KBR. So that's, that's how it works in the government. Most people don't, not aware of that. No, I had no idea. I thought that it was. <laughs> I thought it was like completely yeah. separate. Or, okay, no, not, I didn't not, know about it either before I joined uh, NASA Ames. <laughs> I was like, well, that's the, it's it's a thing that people don't know, but it's, it's that's how it works, you know, because right. um, you know, it's for 
you know, for civil servants, they basically have a job for life and they, you know, and they don't have to apply for funding for grants, if, but they, you know, they can, and a lot of them do. So, you know, they're basically a uh, hard money that, you know, they're there. And, and then let's say if they don't have their own money for their own funding and grants and the projects they're working on is, is done, then they'll be shuffled to another project to work on, you know, things like that. As opposed to a, me working for a contracting company, you know, I work on projects that they assign me to too, but at the same time, I, I mean, I'm applying for grants, you know, I, it's just like you're in academics, you know, as a professor in university, you apply for grants until you get a tenure, right? And in tenure, you still apply for grants and a lot of times in tenure, <laughs> It never stops. Your, your funding is kind of secure and you're not going to get fired. Yeah. Well, that's how it used to be well, in most places. You, so. Right. So, I mean, that's the kind, of, the kind of the comparison. A civil servant, I, in my mind, is a tenure, and a contractor is like your thing, aspiring thing. But then, and, you know, and you don't have to become a civil servant ever, you know, but that's how, how it works. Right. The okay. Government. Okay. That's really interesting. I'm going to have to think about this for a little bit because I, I never. I just never knew that. I assumed that it was more like an interest industry thing, um, like versus academia. But I guess that makes sense that it would be. Yeah. I mean, it's basically the same thing. You're doing this. A contractor and a civil servant are doing right some same jobs, but you know, it's a different. I'm at NASA Ames, but my boss would be more the boss's boss, you know, as a KBR. Mm -hmm. But I still am in a division. You know, it's again, you know, at NASA Ames, you're still in the space biosciences division, and you know, I work with all the contracts work with those civil servants too, you know, same thing. So. Right. And um, can you kind of uh, talk a little bit more about your experience with working at NASA? I know that there are some people um, that, I, I mean, like I have some friends that are like, I want to work for NASA so badly. So like maybe if you can talk about your experience working there and what that's like. Yeah. I mean, you know, as, as you, it, it's, it's, it's a good place, wonderful place to work and this thing as, but as you know, with any government there's red tape. So, you know, that's the one thing that you don't have to deal with economics, but that's okay. That's part of the job. You know? right. With any government agency, with the NIH and that you have red tape, right. but you know, once you get used to that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, it depends, you know, that NASA has, uh, I should know how many they have 10 or nine or 10 <laughs> or 11, <laughs> but they have, you know, locations around the States. I should know yeah. exactly how many there are, but like the, one of the main biology type research, one has done it, NASA Ames Research Center, where I'm at, you know, that's in Mountain View area, in the Bay Area. And uh, that there, I mean, they primarily focus on um, the biology research they primarily focus on, because there are other types of research that happens in NASA Ames for, like, okay. the physics side and hardware development, things like that, which I'm not involved with. But um, the biology side, you know, uh, there is mainly um, looking at the science of it for, like, uh, for example, looking at, like, animal models and using that to, you know, uh, see how the different biology changes at Johnson Space Center. That's the, where the human research program is. So that's where um, you know where they primarily focus on the human part. So the libraries I have that work on like nutritional aspects, like you know how does nutrition uh, change with uh, different different. Um, um. So then, yeah. So then, at NASA Johnson at Johnson Space Center, they have uh, you know the human aspect where you know they work on different aspects where they, they actually get, you know, samples from astronauts, for example, look at physiological changes that occur in astronauts, and then, like, apply, let's say, nutritional facts or exercise, and then there's other research they might do, primarily focus on humans, so that's another part where I have collaborators working there, so, you know, depending on, let's say, the biology aspect where you want to be, you know, there's different places you could work at, um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, I think any type of research you do, it's almost the same, you know, in university setting, of course, it's different, let's say, if you start you know in a university you be grad a uh, postdoc then after you you know get your phd or even as, as you know even if you have a bachelor's you, you, you'd be a lab tech in a lab right. that's pretty much the same you know let's say if you let's say have a bachelor's and you want to work in a lab you know working either at nasa or at a university you're basically going to be doing the same thing it's just a different environment right mm -hmm. and different type of research so of course when you're at nasa you're primarily looking at space research right. space biology. but you know but once you let's say become a like a your own get your own grants i don't have to just work on space biology i could work on other things like cancer or other things too you know if i get the funding for it right so right. then that's all key but yeah i mean and then but you know the same with the postdoc you know if you're a postdoc if you're at depends the career path you want to do of course when you're at nasa you're going to be more exposed to that career path you want to take in space biology research so you know you get more and more people there but that doesn't mean if you're in academics like you could work in a lab with a principal investigator that has NASA grants, which I had done, right? right. So then you you get exposed to the NASA community that way too, because you're working on space biology research 
at the university, but it's through NASA grants you get, you know, from principal investigators. And there's like for postdocs, for example, it's fellowships that you can get also from um, NASA and the Trish program. They have fellowships that you could actually get your own fellowship to work on your own space biology ideas with mentors, of course. Right. Um, and now that you've kind of talked about that a little bit, um, do you have maybe any pieces of advice for people that want to go into space biology? Like where should they, maybe they don't know like where to start. Like what do you, what would your suggestions be? So there's, I mean, there's multiple things. One thing is um, NASA offers internships. There's a, I forget the website, but if you Google it, you'll find it. Right. You know, so they have internships for undergrads, um, even high school students. They have internships in the summertime um, and the undergrads, graduate students, uh, postdocs, you know, so there's a, so it's again, that, that if you, every year they offer it in many different areas um, from, you know, you'd be at Johnson Space Center, you could be at, uh, and it's not just biology, but they also have internships for like the hardware part and the engineers and all that right. stuff. So, you know, you, you look, it's a big list. So you can look on there and be like, oh, look at this fits my, uh, like, let's say if they want to develop work on rockets and things like that, be like, oh, there's internships for that. But if you want to work on biology, there's internships for that, you know? Right. <laughs> so that's, that's one aspect where if people, you know, when, at different stages, like career, younger folks like yourself, you know, want to get involved and yeah, you know, look at the, we'll go to the web internship NASA website and, keep looking and say, oh, okay, and then apply and then right. get in. And then the other part is, you know, maybe if people like you have reached out to me or other folks who are working on that biology, you know, um, a lot of times people won't have extra funding when people come out, you know, do that. But if you want to volunteer time to like work in a short period of time, whenever people have time, that's another right. way of doing it too. Cause I, most people are not going to be saying no to, you know, someone coming in and be like, Hey, I want to help, you know? And then, um, <laughs> Anything I can help with and be like, yeah, of course, you know, <laughs> most, most, I think most people are pretty open to that because, you know, that's people realize supporting the younger folks is the key. Right. <laughs> and then also, you know, you know, getting, getting extra help, you know, younger folks like yourself, I have, you know, ideas and newer ideas that could be helping the projects forward. So that's another thing. I mean, another one is project I work on is called Gene Lab, which is where all the bioinformatics and omics, you know, ends up in NASA world and space biology world. So um, that's it. In Gene Lab, we have these things called analysis working groups, which um, is led by various people. There's four groups. I lead one of them called the multiomics group. There's an animal work, you know, you know, AWG for short. And there's a microbes group and there's a plant group. You know, so they focus on plants, one works on microbes, one works on animals, like inver invertebrates, invertebrates. And then, of course, the multiomics group, which I lead, we work on a lot of different things, but how you could get all the different like types of bioinformatics and omics combined together for big projects so that's 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 for anyone in the scientific community can join from any level of the career from you know undergrads graduate students and so on and higher ups you know you know established investigators right. professors and so on so you got all, all sorts of people in there and then there's projects you know that within it was originally set up to um uh to actually you know help let's say come up with community census for these pipelines that you might use to process these big data like omics right but, uh, you know, but during that time, also, when you get a lot of scientists together, working together, of course, then people want to work on fun projects to answer space biology questions, which is what happens. So there's a lot of different projects like last, and you get, you know, it turns out you get some really great papers out of that. Like last year, we got a paper in Cell looking at mitochondrial. So the group actually did, you know, did this massive project, but, you know, and and it's, it has like 30, 40 authors on there, but you know, that's how it works. And then the paper has yeah. a lot of impact and, and actually brought some new biology. So there's neat projects like that people can work on together. So that's another way, you know, people can get involved outside of the community is join these analysis working groups because open to anyone to join. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once, you know, we have like every, each one of these groups have a uh, monthly meetings at different times. And then, you know, you would, People join this when they can, and then you know they'll discuss projects. People present data, you know, and then eventually people start working with each other, being like, "Oh, that's a cool project. Let's work with each other." And then it evolves to, you know, discovering something new and publishing a paper on it. So that's another way. And then and then once you do that, of course, then you're an author on space biology right. type research. I mean, that's key for the younger people at any stage of your career is getting the publications. <laughs> if your name's on a publications, and you get more and more of those, especially as a you know as an undergrad or a graduate student, you know. Then of course people start being like, oh, see, see that person's CV. Oh, look at all the nice space biology papers. They already are pretty knowledgeable, experienced about that stuff. You know. All right. So that's the key. Definitely. Um, and now, kind of after talking about all of the different 
research you're involved in and the different groups you work with. I'm wondering, like, um, how do you make time for hobbies, like, outside of <laughs> science and work? Is that a challenge or... Well, I mean, that's all how you balance life and stuff. Right. So for me, I've always balanced it. I mean, yeah, I, I, you, the, and it depends how much you want to work and no one tells you or no no one tells me that I should be working, you know, 12 hours a day or eight hours a day mm-hmm. or less or more, you know. But, you know, I, you know, I love what I do, so it's not really work when I'm doing it. But at the same time, for hobbies, yeah, you get to balance it. So, for example, I play music for as a hobby. And so uh, I get together with friends once a week and we play music together, you know, so – that's, you know, you just, you just have to carve the time out because, you know, most, most things when you're working on is not so urgent that you have to, ha- even though, let's say if you're working for professors, like I need it now, you really don't need it. Now. <laughs> Unless there's like I say, a grant deadline that it is really due tomorrow. Yes. Right. Then that's like, you know, that's, that's the, one of the only kind of type of things that would, um, or, or other deadlines for like, you know, applications and, or other things that you want to give in. Right? right. Those are really things I would do, but for, let's say analyzing data, working in a lab, it is good to have a good, fast, you know, momentum getting data out. But, you know, when someone says, oh, we need this now immediately, um, it can wait. You know? Right. <laughs> so that balance is there. And, and I think for people going into labs and working for professors or other folks that might have the attitude that you have to work, um, you know, 24 hours a day, no life for you. Right. Um, it's it's not the quantity, it's the quality. Right. So that's right. that's the key, right? So, you know, I know people, I've, or I've seen people, and I know people who might like be in the lab, for example, when they're in the lab for 12 hours, 13 hours. But then I know people, you know, they're not very efficient. They might, you know, because they're working so long, they might take a lot of breaks. They might do things. Right. So in that 12 hours, I could be more efficient or someone else that didn't, you know, are more efficient with their time and manage it better. In six to eight hours, they could get done what that person's trying to do in 12 to 13 hours. Right. The yeah. same with like, you know, computational work too, as you know, you know, since you're doing computational stuff, you know, that's, you know, a lot of it, you know, it's, you know, a lot of it is how you manage your time, you know, working with a comp how well you could efficiently write a code, you know, the more, you know, the more you work or, or, you know, how to manage the, uh, stay focused in what the project you're working on. <laughs> right. Because as you know, if you write the code, you'd be like, oh, what if I do this? What if you do this? And then you get distracted and then you're doing too many things and then you never get anything done, right? Because you're doing, now you just got went off too many too many tangents so it's, it's really your time management yeah getting that, to the point where you know yeah that definitely makes sense I think like for me um doing computational work it I think at first um you know whenever you're starting something new it's always going to take longer than when somebody else who's experienced is doing it because you're just yeah. getting into it and that's why like when I first started coding it was taking me forever to just oh, yeah. like basic plots up and now I'm actually to the point where I can like you know, do it in like a few lines of code or something like that. But that's your, that, that's your learning curve, right? When, yeah, exactly. exactly. When, you, when you first start with, let's say, the R coding or, you know, Python or things like that, oh, yeah, yeah, you're going you're gonna to spend a lot of time just yeah. messing around, playing with it, and then trial and error, this doesn't work. But, you know, that, you know that's expected. Like when you start, of course, you're going you're gonna, to, but after, let's say, a couple of months or even a year, then you're, when you're proficient at it, then you're like, oh, then, then you can then really, it becomes really easy to, to make figures, process data, and of course, there's newer and newer ways to look at things visually. So then you evolve to learn the newer, you know, scripts that are ways to visualize the data. So, but yeah, yeah, exactly. The beginning is always the case. The beginning, of course, you're going to be in not efficient. You're going to have that learning curve, but that's expected. But then after that is like, you know, that's when you would have to keep your efficiency going and then think about how to manage your time and stay focused, you know, after you learned all the tricks. Right. Exactly. And um, I have one more question uh, to close out on. So what type of music do you guys like to play when you get together? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, I've been playing in bands for, for a long time. So I, I play a lot of different instruments, some piano, guitar, you know, and sing and so you on. Sing. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I uh, we write our own songs and music and stuff like that. So, uh, I mean, some of the songs, uh, well, one of the genre, one of the bands I used to be in, but I guess this band sort of does this too, we call it math rock. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of that. So a lot of people think like it, it, classically, like there's prog rock, progressive rock, like bands right. like King Crimson, Yes, Rush. They're all prog rock. So they're you know complicated time signatures, kind of things like that. Right. So math rock was the evolution of that in the modern time, from you know 90s to now, where you know they would do a little complicated. It's not the standard chord stuff, you know, that you would do 
so that's some of the stuff we do with the weird time signatures and some of the other stuff. I don't. I mean, I guess it's more indie rock is probably where we okay. fall in, but that's a okay. broad category where it could be a lot of different things. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you for joining me today. I really enjoyed this conversation and I learned a lot of new things. So uh, yeah, thank you for your time. No, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it too. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> for the final part of this podcast interview, we learned that in the government, there are civil servants who are directly employed by the government. There are also other people who work for companies that are contracted by the government. Dr. Beheshti works with KBR, who's contracted by NASA. He does space biology research through NASA grants. The type of research you do is translatable to academia and industry. Work on getting exposed to the field through research. If you want to get into space biology, work on applying for NASA internships, reach out directly to people at NASA or join the analysis working groups through Gene Lab. Focus on balancing your life in the way that works best for you. Work on quality over quantity to maximize your time. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for future videos. Follow our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for future updates.